I am unashamed. What about you? So we're back, uh, unashamed. We're coming from different places. If we've told you guys before, we typically film and, re- and uh, record two podcasts per day, uh, although it's kind of spread out a few days for you guys, the listeners. But uh, I'm in Cincinnati, Ohio. I don't think I said that on the last podcast. Lisa and I are speaking tonight at an event in Indiana because we're just, it's interesting where we are right here. You're literally just a few miles, you cross the river, you're in Kentucky. You go 20 minutes, you're in Indiana. So we're literally right here in the corner of these three states. But I love coming to Midwest states. The people are great. Uh, they're very enthusiastic, especially when we're doing something for pro-life like we're doing tonight. Uh, everything we've done, like post-row, people are like excited. You know, they're excited to be together. In fact, it kind of feels good to feel like you're winning again because it kind of felt like we've been losing that battle for a long time. So kind of exciting to be here. Zach's coming in from North Carolina. And the uh, and the guys are in the studio, so and good to be here. Between the break, I got confirmation on my frog hunt that's going on tonight, so it's on. I'm basing this all on one sign of a bullfrog still lingering in first week of October. No problem. It's, they're fixed to bury up in the mud. Yeah, it's got to get much colder than this end of the month, though. They- It'll start. So what is your prediction? You know where I'm going. I'm going to, I'm actually going to a place. There are probably that, a lot of frogs are that have come out. They know that they fixed to bear up in the mud, so they're getting as much food as they can at night, you know. Well, that's where I was going with this. They want one last meal before they bury up in the mud. But look, I want one last meal. Before winter gets here. Uh-huh. Yeah, that almost rhymes. Uh, one last meal before winter this gets here. The theme of this is one last meal. That's the country and western the, song the last you want to give it to. One the, last meal. One last meal. We'll we'll talk to, uh, who was the country music singer, my buddy? Yeah, who uh, was our guy? Aaron, 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 Aaron Watson. Aaron Watson. Uh, I like that guy. So I'll tell him to, to write a song about bullfrog catching in the fall. And call it one last meal, because he's real good at the at the soft and fuzzies, you know. Oh yeah, that's he t- he, he tugs on the heartstrings for sure. Yeah, you yeah. both Bulls can it. achieve. You both can achieve the goal, because the frog will get his one last meal, but he thinks he's going in the mud, but he actually becomes your last meal. So. If you get that frog, it's a win-win, kind of, because <laughs> you everybody intern, wins. Everybody wins. Everybody wins. So I'm excited. How many frog? How many? How many frogs does it take for you to have a meal? How, how well, many will you need? For I you? proved this like, year I'm, during duck season because I told that story, which was a, and I put a picture out there on social media, or so my team did. That you can you can have a meal from one frog because that was one of the more enjoyable meals I've ever had because I had a lot of haters out there in, in who are so called friends. But you said, didn't reserve one frog. No, no, no visitors. Yeah, wow. that that meal, the invitation list was three people: me, myself, and I. Yeah, <laughs> and I. Once you prepare, because everything's all in your mind, if you only have one frog, you highlight the one frog. Mm -hmm. I had some some home fried potatoes, what we call hail fries, because that was some of our family members were hail, H-A-L-E, for you legalists out there. And so we, they, (laughs) they did some, some fries that were, and I have a special recipe. I've shared that before. It's not the recipe. It's how you from. It's a slow frying, more potatoes than oil. They're not, it's not a deep frying. It's a, it's a shallow fry. Like a saute. It's a saute and you can do a potato. And what happens yeah. if you do that, because it's, it's, it goes through a period of mush. You, Cause I ruined the first few that I tried to do this. You make the potatoes mushy, and then you get the fire wide open, and then it, it put the it crisp, crisp the outside. But yep. they're they're oh they're 
they're warm and fuzzy. Well, you, do you boil the so we boil the potatoes and then we get it in the skillet and smash them where they're seared and they get that caramelization on the outside. This is a yeah, little bit of that. The dashers this, call them the smashed potatoes, but they're really good too. That's, this, a, that's this, another. The fry, when I'm done, will the potato will shrink 50%. It shrinks them, which is very interesting. I don't know the science involved in that. And what happens is the potato flavor does the opposite of shrink. What would that word be? You're the, uh, you got some eschatology. It expands, it expands. It expands. It expands the flavor while shrinking the actual potato. I thought you would have yes. a better word than expand, but it's great. Well, sc- it's great I'm, Scrabble word. I, I don't want to offend anybody on this podcast. Cause it's like, what, <laughs> Look, do you know, stir. Zach, that I went home <laughs> immediately after that last podcast and because my wife always says, how'd the podcast go when I come? And it's always interesting because I don't know because I don't listen to them. But every once in a while, I'm like, well, that went off the rails. I don't know. Maybe, the, you know, I hope the Lord works it out or whatever. But when she asked me on this occasion, I said, well, Zach was there. And she she loves your, uh, you know, listening to you, Zach, from your theology of the Bible because we're similar, you know, which is because we've said that before, we have similar theology. I said, but the first sentence out of Zach's mouth, I said he used eschatology and syntax, which got an immediate <laughs> eye roll. And you, do you know what she said? Do you know, because I didn't say anything else. Do you know the first sentence out of her mouth? She said, well, there's probably less than 100 people who knew what those two words meant. <laughs> who listen to y'all's podcast. So that was either a, a little jab at the listeners of our podcast and the sophistication, or you're using way too big a word, Zach. Yeah. We, we, we will find out. Time will, we'll look, see what it, the, I know there'll be just people that are email, but I know there's like a big group of you guys that listen to us and gals on the Facebook group. So, and I get those reports from Steve and others who are working with you guys. And so I want you to post and tell on there what who's right about this. Is it is it Jace or is that, I want to I want to know now because Unashamed Nation needs to speak into this so we'll know and then uh, we'll see what people say. Well, no, wait a minute. If you're going to make a competition out of this, I'm going to say <clears throat> I leave it. You don't have to sell anything. Just let it. Just okay, let, let. The it, question let it go. was how many frogs and nobody ever answered it. Okay. How many frogs do you need? <laughs> Because you just sit there and make a meal. That like, was a good. You need deal. more. As a rule, you need more frogs than people. You'd there was a off. man at, in your stage of your life who's not known for his memory. You have really knocked it out of the park. Because you're right. I had forgotten the, the original question. I would say the perfect amount for a family of four would be a dozen. At least. At, oh, I, I'm saying, uh, yeah. I mean, that's. That's that's you gotta a, remember that's you a have frog. small frogs with smaller legs and big frogs with big legs. How so profound. the size of the frog becomes a pertinent question. That is true. A lot of, you know, but the you, the younger they are, the, the the more tender they are. Oh, you're right. And uh, you have to know how to cook frogs or you or you mess them up. Well, but exactly. Jace, I've noticed when you go, if you eat frogs out somewhere, like there's some places that'll have frog legs and then when we we're good. in France filming, yeah. they had them over there too. And they're always small. I've never seen big frogs at a place where you buy frogs. No, they're always I little. I, I have. So that's not a hundred percent rule. I okay. have seen. I, I they, just never had. And there is a level they get too big. And I've told you, I've always wanted to go to Africa because the world's largest frog dwells there and they don't eat them. Just be having frogs on a body of water. It's a good testament. That's good water. Yeah. Frogs don't survive if the water is tainted with something. Nope. It has to be good water. Fresh water. Really? Oh, yeah. Okay. They do way better. I've looked, I've seen some places where I've caught some frogs that the water didn't look like. I don't know if I'd drink it if I was. Yeah, there's some rugged terrain where frogs live. 
Well, I mean, just the, you know, it's usually swampy. Yep. But it, it's full of life, you know. What what we think is a, you know, a pig pen, you know, pigs like mud and frogs like swampy. Yeah. Plus, there's a rule so Jason, with frog hunters never reveal where you got them. Well, exactly. Yeah, they're. They're very secretive. And you never Jace, print do you think out the, the, the f- invitation list no. either to the meal. <laughs> no. That is, it's the party that never it's the party that never happened with no invitation. List. Secret society among frog hunters is you're never invited or listed on the what do they call it? The R S V P. There's no R S check. R S V P. Check no. Which so what were you saying? So, Jace, do you think the frogs in the plague back in in uh, Egypt in Exodus? Do you think those were bullfrogs? I don't. I don't. I don't. You I think, think they else? were more the toad variety because they're more. They would be harder to deal with. I, I'm assuming if you're going to, because there's over. I'm, I was going to say a thousand, but I don't have a scientific basis for this. But I've I, there's hundreds of frog species. You know, yeah, just so. a few few of them that you can eat. Well, right. I mean, their legs don't keep. Well, some of them they actually use in in warfare in the native times of our culture. They would take the skin and remove the what? What am I? Looking five thousand. They would. It's five. The the answer you're looking for is five thousand, according yeah. to PBS. But there's, over 5,000 species of known frogs. There's some no. poison on some different frogs that That's you right. can take the liquid and dip an arrow in, and if it hits you, it will kill you. Yeah. So you don't want to be eating 200, 220 species are poisonous frogs. Okay. Out of 5,000. Out of 5,000. So and we I would know think, from lo- uh, yeah, Al, you have the plague. I would think of you know those two hundred and twenty variety. Probably those were used, <laughs> but if you you know, it just depends on how bad you want to get it. Because when I first read that story as a kid, I thought, well, what kind of plague is that? That'd have been the happiest day you of could, my you, life. You call that a ble- you would call that a blessing. Yeah. So I figured that it was the because some some frogs urinate more than others, and you know when you touch them and. We don't want to go down that road, but I'm just saying, like your basic. <laughs> and remember the frog, he's was, it nasty. the was it the horn was it the horn frog mm-hmm. that uh, Lone Waddy told us and Josie Wales that tells you where, what direction you're supposed to go when he he, yeah, he laid him exactly. on Eastwood. Yeah, that that was so, the non edible type. But I got frogs. Yeah. He's just there to give you directions. I've got a bullfrog at the top of the heap on things I like to to eat. I, I got the shrimp as a close second and and then i got, are good. got the crappie in the fish that that's my top three so if you when i'm gonna have a special occasion frog shrimp or crappie would be my top three 99 percent of the people who say they don't like the oh i can't eat frogs if they eat one they're, oh, well, they're, they're yeah. hooked from that point on oh uh, including my wife yeah who said i will never they ain't eating no frog. You bring in those nasty things. I said, this is one of the cleanest animals on the planet. Yep. And uh, that's what I was going to say, Jace. Your, th- your top three are three of the cleanest eats you can have. Those are very uh, flaky and or white. I personally like uh, the midsize as the best. Well, the I'm mid-size. with you, Phil. They are the best. Yep. So there's your All frog, right, well, guess- your daily frog devo. For potential frog gatherings, <laughs> I'm just wondering how many other pod, how many other podcasts open their podcasts. You can buy them frogs. from the <laughs> local, aren't you? At your most local markets, because Miss Cagby gets them and buys them. Bring but them. they go from a, if you buy it at the local market on a scale from one to ten, you just went from ten to five. That's right. Now five's not bad, so yeah. it's it's not terrible. But I'm just saying, if you had that experience and say, well, I don't like frogs. Well, you ate a five. Yep. So <laughs> a, a, ten, a five is a long way from ten. Yep. Well, there you go. Let's, uh, let's take our first break. 
one of the things we say about fall is, you know, you can't quite tell about the weather. It's, it's cool at night. It's hot during the day. So you kind of got to be ready for anything. And to do that, you need underwear that can handle everything. And that's our Tommy John underwear. And his dad says, you may even get a wow from your wife uh, when you're wearing them. They're very, very comfortable. Um, I, I love them. I've loved this product long before they were sponsors of our podcast. They have very breathable, uh, lightweight fabric. It has four times the stretch of other brands. They have but what they call a no wedgie guarantee, which I know Jace is happy about that. Um, so it, they're really good. They got a 17 million pair of soles. So obviously, people love Tommy John underwear, as as do I. So uh, they also have a Tommy John best pair you'll ever wear, or it's free guarantee. So you have nothing to lose by trying these underwear. Uh, we all wear them. We love them. Our wives love them. They have great loungewear as well and other products, more than just underwear. So I want you to check them out. I think you're going to love them. TommyJohn.com slash Phil. You're going to get 20% off your first order just for being an unashamed listener. So that's 20% off TommyJohn.com slash Phil. See their site for details. All right. So we're going from frogs to Mark. Uh, we're in the book of Mark chapter five and, uh, Jace, when we were in the overtime, cause you had read this uh, story in the last podcast, but we didn't have a chance to unpack it or break it down at all. We did a little bit, uh, in the overtime segment, but you had, uh, I want you to repeat those, uh, you had six things that you thought tied together these two healings because you had a, and just to, as a refresher to audience, you had a, a, a synagogue ruler. Uh, Jairus that had a daughter, 12 year old daughter that was dying. And he comes to Jesus to get him to go with him to heal her. And so Jesus is going with him, but there's so much uh, crowd traffic as Jace described that he can't get there because as they're going, not only are they trying to get through this humanity, there's also a woman who's been bleeding for 12 years She's lost and spent all her money, went to doctors, never could get anything done. And so she, her faith was, if I could just, if I could just touch, you know, his cloak. If I could just touch anything near him, I'll be healed. That's how strong her faith was. And it happened. Jesus, Jesus says, who touched me? And the disciples were like, they almost, the answer was almost who didn't touch me. And, and so then Jesus calls her out and I'm like you, Jay's, I think he knew who she was. He just wanted her to have the moment you know, to finally come clean. And she did. It said she told him her whole story, but all this is going on in real time. Jairus is saying, we got to get to my kid. Mm -hmm. Some guys come up in this moment and they say, your daughter's dead. We don't need to bother Jesus anymore. And Jesus says, don't be afraid. Just believe. So, and Jay, so then why, he goes, why would, uh, why would the Lord give strict orders not to let anyone know about this? That's when immediately the girl stood up. She was a dead girl and walked around. She was 12 years old. So well, I think we referred to that before I give my list of these six similarities. It's, you know, God's plan in his time is what matters, first of all. And so you have the one, one the easy answer is, well, when you go to 1 Corinthians 2 and it says some of the rulers yep. and the authorities didn't know that, this was a mystery. This was kept secret because if they would have known who Jesus was and is, him. they wouldn't have crucified him. So I think that's the easy answer. But I also think there was a process that God introduced here that allowed people to slowly and maturely wrap their head around the God of the universe, the creator of all things, including us, is here. It, it's just... You know, if you, because what is your first reaction when you see a magic trick that which is someone doing something supposedly supernatural? What, what's your first reaction? It can't be. It's a, it's they a, do it's a scam. You, you're a skeptic it's about a scam. it. It's like, I mean, I was watching a football game last night and the video game commercial ca came on and all it was was a football, electronic football field with X's and O's on it. You might have seen it. And as this, there's a play-by-play -play announcer saying, well, it looks like the game is over, you know, unless a miracle happens. You know, So they use the word miracle. It's a football game. It's a video game. So look, 
and then there you're watching the X's and O's on the on the board, and the announcer says he drops back to pass. Time expires. Oh, he cut. He catches it. He makes a move. Unbelievable. So he's in in his analysis. He started using all these words: unbelievable, unimaginable, impossible. I think that was the last one because the guy finally scored. The impossible has happened. It's a miracle. And that was the commercial. <laughs> and I thought, wow. <laughs> really, I thought, are you kidding me? You're using all these terms, so I'll buy your stupid video game? None of that really happened the way you described it. Yeah. And they actually was trying to get you to have faith to believe in something you couldn't see because you were just looking at X's and O's. So what I'm saying is God knows that. And so he he limits the crowd who was in the room. And that's why he said only Peter, James, and John could come with him. And by the way, those three were the same only three that witnessed the transfiguration. So you got those three here, seeing a girl rise from the dead. You got those three and those three only seeing Moses, Elijah, and Jesus having a conversation in illuminated, imperishable form. Wrap your head around that. Yeah. And there was another instance uh, somewhere where those three, I can't remember it off the top of my head. but They it, all together to later. still had problems with believing it. Well, right. So that's, that's to answer your question. So the six similarities that I saw. And so, look, yeah, so he was telling, Jace, before off. you leave that, he was telling the Jairus's and his family were the ones, because obviously Peter, James, and John, he wanted them there to witness it because they needed to know. But you're right. Whatever his reasoning was, he was still keeping this as much as possible under wraps. And this, again, but you know what a lot of people thought, Dave. You, you, know, you mentioned about the whalers. You know, in, in those times, they used to hire people to come and wail at your house over the loss. That's why they weren't serious about it. They were laughing at Jesus because – they were hired to do that. This let people know, this let neighbors know, everybody that, you know, something bad had happened here. But you know good and well, a lot of people thought, well, she really wasn't dead. I mean, they just thought she was dead, and then she came back. But but the Luke account says her spirit came back to her. So he, he makes it clear, because Jesus says she was asleep, but he meant sleep, as the New Testament talks about us falling asleep when we die. So she was dead. And he brought her well, back. Well, I, yeah, I, because, because I, I talked about that in the overtime of the last podcast. You got to remember, Phil, in this moment, Jesus changed universally where we, every human puts a period at the end of the sentence. Your daughter is dead. We put a period there. Jesus, he, he changed that to a comma. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a lot for a human being to absorb. Yeah. There's a period there for a reason. That's the end. It's over. It's never going to happen. I'll never believe it. We'll never see her again. And he's like, oh, no, she's back going again. That that That's hard for the human mind to absorb. So God, in his wisdom, he did it the way he did. By the way, the third time Jane, Peter, James, and John, or it was those three, was uh, in when Jesus was in the garden right before he was arrested. So I, you see some similarities here. They saw him raise this girl from the dead. They saw post-resurrection. Then they saw Jesus led in, in that, that powerful moment when he's fixed to go die. So I think God in his wisdom did the same thing with those three fellas that what I'm explaining on why he told people not to tell anybody. Is there's a process? You gotta remember, this thing keeps being ratcheted up. Yeah. And you go two more chapters. It's the first time he said, "Listen, I'm going up to Jerusalem. All right. I'm die, there's a buried. process that you have to. And Peter under ain't buying it. He ain't buying that. There's a process you have to go as a human to believe that even though you're perishable, you're indestructible in Jesus. Yeah. It. You, <clears throat> nobody gets that in five seconds. That's right. Because you may say you got it. But then you walk out and immediately, you know, here comes a car and what happens? You're filled with fear, you know, yep. in a wreck or whatever. I'm going to die. Oh, no. What's happening? Oh, yeah. Well, what happened to this resurrection stuff? Well, it's very. So and you fast forward to that. 
you know, two of those fellas ended up giving their life rather than deny Jesus. Well, they had seen these things happen. So the similarities hang, hang I saw there. in the two stories. Hang on, hang on. Before you, before you do that, let's uh, let's take another break. So one of the most, um, I guess, you, you know, the media would call it controversial, but I would call it one of the most important uh, issues going on in our world today is is the issue of life and abortion. And uh, we know because of uh, Roe v. Wade being overturned and sent back to the states that now the battle lines have sort of been redrawn and, uh, and the battle still goes on. And uh, we need groups that are really have been there this whole time uh, to rally people. And one of those groups is a, is a group called 40 Days for Life, uh, which Lisa and I totally love these guys. Uh, Sean's been on our, our podcast before. He's their CEO, and he loves life, he loves people, and he loves the Lord. Uh, they have over a million volunteers in a 1,000 cities. They hold peaceful vigils outside abortion facilities where they pray. That's their main thing is just to pray. Uh, they have huge uh, impact in states like California and Illinois and some of the most pro-abortion states, but they're making a difference because they're on the front line. So we want you to check these guys out. Check out their locations. See if you can volunteer. Check out their podcast. They have a free magazine uh, that Lisa's contributed an article to as well. So it's 40daysforlife.com. They're going to keep you updated on how abortion is ending in a post royal America, which is what we've been praying for for almost now 50 years. That's 4040daysforlife.com. Check them out. Okay, number one, there was no remedy to their situation. The girl, the the older woman, she had been diagnosed 12 years earlier, and she had gotten worse. Spent all her money, and everybody who's had a bad medical condition and then made only worse by doctors. I mean, what a terrible e- existence. Uh, and the other girl, 12-year-old girl, if a 12-year-old girl is dying, I mean, obviously, we don't know what the problem is because that gets people's attention, you know. So there was no remedy. They He referred to them both as daughters when he, when he healed them. Well, one of them was a daughter, I mean, obviously 12 years old and the dad had had done, but the other one, I thought it was interesting that he called her daughter, which I think was a, a sign that this was God's plan. We're all sons and daughters, you know, of the heavenly father, uh, three, they were both, this was an unclean, it would be unclean. And I, I listed two verses in the overtime Leviticus 15, 25 through 30 and numbers 19, 11 through 20. You couldn't, touch someone disease like that and you couldn't touch a dead body which jesus technically didn't do that because when he touched them they weren't like that anymore (laughs) (laughs) hilarious for it was done by faith but it was faith in the in the uh in the event with the daughter it was the dad's faith that led her to jesus or jesus to her let's see how many is that No remedy, daughters, unclean, faith. Uh, Shoot, hang on. What was the other one I said? Uh, You said it earlier. Oh, okay. All right. 12 year journey. You cut that out. Yep. (laughs) So they both had a 12 year journey, which I don't think is an accident that Mark tells us that because. That's a powerful, powerful image where you have two different journeys of life, and we're all different. We all have different circumstances. Probably, maybe, you know, just in your imagination, they could have been in the hospital 12 years earlier. One is diagnosed with this disease. The other's born. It's One's happy, one's sad, but they both wound up in terrible circumstances at the feet of Jesus. I think that's a powerful moment. And the last similar thing I noted was they all learned there's a difference in knowing about someone and having an experience with the one being in the presence of Jesus. So that they had heard about him and whatever they thought, but they got more than they came for in both instances. I mean, she was just trying to touch the cloak, but what did he do? 
He singled her out, listened to her story, had the conversation, gave her words of encouragement, and in the same situation with, with the little girl, which is what, what the experience of Jesus, I mean, you see where I'm going with that. You can know about Jesus. The earth is full of people that know about Jesus, but those who experience it in their own everyday life, oh, that's... That's a whole other level. That's I mean, transformational. It's the uh, yes, that is transformational, and that's the thing that I think that we we always think that if we have the right information, I've said this before on the podcast, that that's going to lead to transformation, and, and, and it really doesn't. You know, you think about the things that you do as a Christian, things you do, you still are falling short. It's not that you don't know better. You do know better. It's the, your, whatever area in your life that is, that hasn't been transformed yet, and you're still desiring something that's not of God. And what, what transformation means practically, it means that your desires are transformed f- from the kingdom of Zach to the kingdom of God. I, I want to desire what he desires. That's why Jesus said, if you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you'll be filled. The reason why you'll be filled is because you're hungering, uh, hungering for something that he, he will provide and promises to provide. If you hunger for that, it's like get all you want. You're, you're going to be satisfied. But I was thinking about the difference of, of knowing about Jesus and knowing, uh, knowing Jesus. It's like if you've ever been to a place overseas or somewhere that you've read about or even maybe it's a big city that you read about and you've heard you know these words like we went to, we got to go to greece and so there's mars hill there's the acropolis there's just all the things that are there that i had read about and when i, I had a reference point when i talked about them because i knew about them and i could tell people what i had read about but when we traveled to greece and and walked up the hill and stood on the rock of the area, Areopagus, which you read about in Acts 17, like that whole experience, like Acts 17 took on a whole new meaning for me because I was there. I, w- I touched the physical place. Um, Phil was up there standing up on a rock quoting Acts 17, the sermon that Paul preached. And it, it, so I think it's like that. When you go to these like foreign countries and you can't people even pronounce wept. the name of the city. Pe- people wept. They wept because they were there. And I think it's like if you think about when you're trying to explain, like you you're, you hear people talk about like reporters, talk about uh, foreign countries and cities that you can't pronounce. You can't remember the name of them. But once you go there and you meet the people and you eat the food and you are engulfed in the culture of that, of that you're in the presence of that particular place, you, it, it just flows out of you then. You're not having to recall it. How do I pronounce that? It just flows out of you. And I think that's what a – a transformed life looks kind of like that. It's where an untransformed life where you know about Jesus, you're having to conjure up and, and, and out of your own willpower, you're having to muster up the strength to live right and to do good. I still keeps talking about, but when you're transformed, the doing good is flowing out of you because you're caught up in the life of God. You're it's just flowing out of you. It's not necessarily these cognitive decisions you're making all the time. Doing good just comes out of you. And that's the difference between information and transformation. So I think that's a huge point, Jace. Yeah, I do too. And you see what happens in all three cases in Mark 5 out of that transformation. So there was desperation, as I said, that linked them together. Then there was this encounter, healing encounter with Jesus. Then you see transformation. And what do you see in all three cases? Joy. Joy comes out of the idea. Now, all these people still live their lives. I'm sure they had setbacks. They had difficulties. But look at just the overflowing joy out of each of these situations. This isolated woman who had not been able to even go to a dinner party for 12 years now has freedom to be back in the lives of other people. And I I, I wonder about it, Zach. What what do you think about this this Jairus? I mean, I wonder what his life was like post that because he's a synagogue ruler. He's one of the Jewish leaders here in this town. But now he knows. I mean, I, I wonder if he ever doubted again who Jesus is once he brought his daughter back to him. I mean, it had to have transformed his life from then. I mean, I don't know that, but you would think, you would hope that he would have never wavered after that fact. But, you know, who knows? No, that's a good question. That's a good point. Let's take another break. So we know when you got big decisions uh, in life, uh, the best thing to do is make some plans, right? You t- can't just put yourself on autopilot and expect everything to work out. When you get married, you buy a house, you got to plan on things. And that also includes uh, health care. Uh, we all know health care is, is a mess. And, um, you know, 
we need such, we need something that can guide us into something better. And Crowd Health, which is one of our new sponsors, which we're excited about, uh, puts your health care back into your hands. It cuts out the middleman. It saves you money. Uh, and, and it funds your health care costs without relying on big government or big insurance companies, which is always a good thing. Um, you can see any doctor you want. There's no deductibles, exclusions, or co-pays. You only pay the first $500 of any health care event. The crowd health community takes care of the rest. So you don't have these exclusive doctor networks. You don't have the huge premiums and the huge deductible, high deductibles. No surprises. We want to plan this thing out. They put community back in community health care. You pay one low monthly total to fund your account. Your monthly subscription helps fund health care costs of the entire crowd health community. So unlike insurance, there's no doctor network. So you can see any doctor that you want to see. It's simple. Uh, it reverses all these incentive processes that are there, and we want you to check it out. Take charge of your health care today with crowd health. Open enrollment is the only time you can hit eject on the broken system without penalty. So don't wait. For a limited time, join for just $99 per month for your first six months when you use the promo code UNASHAMED at joincrowdhealth.com. That's joincrowdhealth.com. Use the promo code UNASHAMED. Crowd Health is not health insurance. It's a totally different way of paying for health care. Terms and conditions may apply. Well, I was going to say, you know, one interesting thing I saw when he raised this little girl is he says this Aramaic line, which I was scared to pronounce when I read it, but Talitha Kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. And I was going to make the point that the problem the Jewish leaders and the Pharisees and the scribes we're having is statements like this when he says, I say to you, because they're like, well, nobody can do that, but, but God, and, and now we're talking about doing something that is impossible. That is no doubt a miracle. If, if a girl's dead and she comes back to life and you have that kind of authority. But what I did find as a byproduct that I thought y'all would find interesting because there's a lot of charities and names around this Talitha. Because when I looked it up, I was stunned at how much was out there. But you know what I found fascinating? Is that in 2020, 68 newborn American girls were given the name Talitha. And in 2021, 51. I just think it's a mate because they get they're getting it from this right here. So a lot of times when you think, man, nobody's believing out there and we're outnumbered, and I just thought it was fascinating that people are naming their little girls based on this story in Mark chapter five, which I took that as a positive sign. W worthy of note. <laughs> it's worthy of note. I knew you'd like that factoid, <laughs> but it's a very inspiring story. I don't know even know. I mean, people in the world, here's a 12 year old girl. I mean, who doesn't want to, doesn't want to help that. And what's amazing is the people are not rallying around Jesus as you would think. Now, granted, he was keeping it halfway secret, but you know, this is getting out, but people are just not wanting to allow their mind to believe that God is here. It's a difficult thing then and now. Jace, you were talking about names, the, the Talitha names. So Alex named my oldest grandson, who's named after me. His name is Corbin Marshall. But the Corbin part comes from, most people don't realize Corbin is a biblical name. And it comes from Mark 7, which we hadn't gotten there yet. But over in Mark 7, uh, verse 11, uh, it says, Jesus talking, he says, whatever you might otherwise have received from me is Corbin. That is a gift devoted to God. And so that's why they named him Corbin, because uh, he's a gift devoted to God, which was just interesting that we were in that same context. But that's what people do. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think you see the link together for the, these three stories. And, and I want to 
be able to read this so we can talk about some on this podcast in the overtime. We've we've referenced this, but I think it makes it all the more astonishing of what happens when Jesus goes uh, to Nazareth, which is his hometown. He's been doing most of this stuff in Capernaum. Remember, Capernaum is where Peter's from. And so that's been the region that he's been spending most of his time in with everything we've been reading up to now. But in chapter six, verse one, he left there, Capernaum, which is about, by the way, 21 miles from Nazareth. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples, six, verse one. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were amazed. You know, and I don't now that amazement, I don't know if that's because he was the hometown guy and came back and they saw he had grown. They were just amazed at what he did. Where did this man get these things? They asked. What's this wisdom that has been given him that he even does miracles? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son? Which, by the way, that's a slight because normally they would have said Joseph's son. Um, you, you would never call him by the mother's son unless you didn't know who the dad was. So. That wasn't exactly a compliment. Isn't this Mary's son and the brother or, or of James? what about if he was dead? I heard some people say, or or he could have been. If that's where they get the idea that Joseph was dead, but either way, but but and that could be true. But typically, still in that culture, you would have you would have referenced the dad's name even yeah. not being there. So I think it was a little bit of a slide, yeah. but anyway, who knows? Uh, and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon aren't his sisters here with us. And then here's the, here's the, here's the, the kicker. And they took offense at him. So they're amazed. They can't explain it. But, you know, Jace, you talked about this back in, what was it, Mark 3, or when it was liar, lunatic, or Lord. Here it is now. They, they've taken offense. Like, who does he think he is? Jesus said to them, only in his hometown, among his relatives and his own house, is a prophet without honor. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. So well, there, there's a lot of <laughs> shocking. Con- yeah, there's a lot. And what's amazing to me is there's a lot of controversy in this paragraph in the religious world. You mentioned one that the, he was referred to as Mary's son. And then this idea of. Uh, there's so much controversy about who these brothers were because some believe that since Mary was a virgin, they believe she was always a virgin. So these weren't, these were like, uh, what would that be? Cousins, I guess, (laughs) you know, instead of actual, I mean, to me, look, it does as a follower of Jesus, I don't have to know all these details. I get it. But the I think the most controversial is when the, the wording in verse 5, which is he could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them, and he was amazed at their lack of faith. Because they're taking that to mean there was something there that wasn't allowing his power to come forth. I always took it to mean just because they didn't believe it and they didn't want it. But but a lot of religious people say no that that there was a spirit there that was like messing up the telepathic ability to do it. So I'm just throwing that out which, there. Is, is which I, yeah I, I, read I read way some, more about read. that than I did any practical illustration <laughs> when I was doing my research. I, I yeah, go back I did, to I, the old old adage that they have reinforced. Nothing's impossible for God, including well, that's performing me. miracles I, if he wanted I, to. I, 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 if you ask me what I think, it was that they, you know, it just, he, he wasn't doing them because they didn't want it, which, it, which would right. be, that would be the reason you wouldn't do it. I mean, you, saw their you hearts. believe that? I mean, when you think about if, if Jesus. He knew of, miracles, it wouldn't change their mind. Well, right. And if, and if Jesus offends you, what does that say about you? <laughs> Well, you think about the whole thing we talked about a few chapters back about to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. I mean, he did perform miracles in the face of people who ultimately were going to reject him. And not even just reject him, they were going to go even further and and they were going to blame the, that work of the Spirit on the work of the devil. So 
you see Jesus in the gospel of Mark uh, in, in just these first few chapters. You kind of see competing things here. But one, you do see him performing miracles among people who had no faith um, and had, in fact, that, to the point that they, they committed blasphemy. Um, so, yeah, I think I think this is kind of one of those things that goes back into God's. But if your you own know, family members, he mentions only in his own hometown among his relatives and in his own house is a prophet without honor. If you end up and you being his family members, being raised with him, heard what he had to say and then started watching what he was doing and you still are not all in, what good would it do to perform miracles? Well, and, and yeah. I, look, I looked this hang up. On, hang on, Jace. Hang on. Let's take our last break. Go ahead. So they thought this community was about 500 people, a small yep. village. Well, they're all aware that his family's not supporting him because this – this episode that it, you know if you have a village of 500 people and so you don't they have, took offense at him it you, says don't, when he, you don't have a tv or a cell phone guess what people are talking and they're <laughs> this is just you would think you'd have your raw raw people your own brothers and sisters are over there supporting you all the way but no no not in this case yeah it's uh and the people that he's hanging out with, let's just say they're uh, shady. They had seen enough miraculous things where they should have believed. But you were right in saying in the book of Acts, at some point in there, after he died, was being raised from the dead, they had a moment. And they said, they had a we, better moment. Get, we better get on board with this. Well, yeah, but think I, about it, though. Think about it, Jace, because you got 30 years earlier, there's this his mother saying that she got pregnant but by God, not by her husband, because yeah. what he married yet. So that starts it. So you know this family already has a mark on them in this community. Then the second thing is his siblings, and I believe they're siblings, not cousins, but his siblings, they went to Capernaum basically to tell him he was crazy. So they're not speaking good things about Jesus back home in the community. They're, they're in with the other people. Well, so you, you, you put all that together. You remember you know. Nathaniel when he summed up Nazareth? Because look, yeah. we have towns in our area that we make <laughs> jokes about. I'm not going to mention any of them. No, but you know he summed up Nazareth with "Ain't nothing good ever come out of there." Yeah, that's right. Which is probably why God chose that place to send. To, I mean, because God usually does the opposite of what you're thinking. Plus, on top of everything else, Al. Uh, he, he could not do any miracles there except, uh-oh, lay his hands on a few people and heal them. Well, most people said, well, that wasn't a very big deal. Uh, that There wasn't much miracles there. Unless you were the one with cancer that he healed. Yeah, that's, that's what big I'm deal. saying. <laughs> I'm, that's what I'm saying. The lack of compassion is just appalling here. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think the big, uh, big, big concern here, though, is it, and what we we don't want to say is that the miracles of God and the works of God are are dependent on our faith. Um, you know, our, our faith isn't. We're not conjuring up works of God. You know, it's not. I th and I've, right. I've thought that before. And and if you if you go if you're not careful, you because a lot of people say that you know oh, you know the miracles happen because we believe they're going to happen. Well, that's not really the the yeah. New Testament experience. The New Testament experience was that miracles happened amongst unbelieving people to confirm what Jesus was saying was true. And then the same thing happened in, in the book of Acts. Uh, the, it wasn't like when they spoke in tongues in Acts chapter two that everybody said, like, you know what? I think we should speak in tongues today. They didn't know what it was. Yeah. It, 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 came, it came on them. And yeah. to the point where everybody's like, wait, what? Like how in the world is this happening? It, it didn't happen because they were open to it. And um, I think that that's true today, too, is if we if we make it about contingent on us, then we are robbing God of, of, of his glory. We're basically saying, oh, we're we're conjuring this stuff up. You yeah. know, we're we're because of our holiness, because of our righteousness, because of our what that just fill in the blank because of me, this is happening. And that is not really what this is about yeah. at all. That's a uh, way so better be articulation of the issue of what I read because I didn't I didn't agree. I'm like Zach. I didn't agree with that. To me, it wasn't controversial at all. It only became controversial when all of a sudden 
you're saying their lack of faith was limiting the power of God. Well, yeah. I categorically disagree with that. Yeah, oh, yeah. And, and to your second point, Zach, I don't even think what's happening now is anywhere close to what was happening in Acts 2 when they were, it says they began to speak in tongues, and it said each person, and it already listed probably 30, 40 nations, yeah. was hearing his own language from from one source, from the speaking in tongues. People who didn't Whoa. know their language. So it'd be like if I had 10 different countries who had never studied English here, and I make a couple statements, and each one hears their language from my words, you know, you're talking about a miracle. Oh. We have a translator and an interpreter of multi-sources without that any equipment or miracle. any other voice besides God, which is, that's a miracle. And to Zach's point, and that's for God showing, hey, listen, to, don't, don't get hung up on how that happened. Listen to what I'm saying. And, of course, what Peter well, did, yeah. he introduced Jesus, which is the same. Mm -hmm. If right now you started uttering what we're reading in about 20 nations that don't, don't speak English, yeah, that'd be a miracle. It'd be a miracle. Well, what I'm saying well, is Jesus it, 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 is trying to reintroduce himself here. You know, go ahead. Well, the next two, it's the next two. You have like, it would it would be the equivalent of me speak me one guy speaking one language. Like I'm speaking in English, and then there's ten people hearing me speak, and he's hearing it in Chinese. He's hearing yeah, it in Mandarin. Just, he's hearing it. That's what I said. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. What I, I, I just I was just reemphasizing that point. That, <laughs> no, it's not hard. It's impossible. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's. Uh, yeah. So I, I I mean that's a valid point and and to Phil's point, he did he did do miracles here. I mean it says he could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. The miraculous I, was not shut down. Well, over I, I figured those sick people were some of the few desperate people who did have faith that he was the Son of God, and so. That's why I'm saying if you're offended at Jesus, he's probably not going to help you. <laughs> and that, that's on you. But even if he would, if he does, you're still up to you to figure out, well, are you going to embrace him enough to, to repent, you know, transform, yeah. follow him. surrender. So, well, so here's, here's another less practical danger for us. If we, if and I've seen this happen with a lot of people that um, I've met with over the years that have come out of uh, a mentality that somehow they had to conjure up in their own righteousness, these works of God. What happens is, is, is you have to start manufacturing and faking uh, these things in your life. And it's a, uh, and then you're, you're living under condemnation because you're like, wait, I'm not seeing this stuff produced and you're you think it's a reflection of your own self and so it's like it's it, what it is it's another form of a workspace system because what you're saying is god does for me because i perform for him and that's not the gospel the gospel god doesn't do anything for us because we perform for him god does something for us because we are dead in our sin and we have no capability and he loves us and and, and he wants to invite us into a relationship with him not because of any work that we've done but because of the finished work of Christ. So I think this is this kind of mentality that to think that, and I'm not saying that this is what Mark six is about. I just think you can't extract that from Mark six. You have to interpret the work of Jesus through his entire ministry, not through, you know, Mark six, five. You I have mean, it's God like you can't, speaking to you in a very thick book that he had written down. When someone says, God spoke to me, I'm thinking, yeah, he speaks to me all the time. Every time I open this up, he, he's telling me what he what he wants me to do, where I was, where I am. He's behind mm -hmm. me. He's for me. Uh, so I, I just there's a lot of people God speaking well, to them, but you can read yeah. what he said. But it but it is talking about that somewhat, Zach. I mean, because it's these people should have been the first people on the list to be proud of Jesus and to you know put their little sign that says 
like Bernice, Louisiana, you know, it has a sign that says home, birthplace of Willie Robertson. You know, well, what's he done? Uh, I mean, Duck Dynasty, okay. You, you know what I mean? The, we're, we're talking about here, you had the creator of the universe <laughs> decide for this to be his hometown, and you won't even listen? Yeah. Well, I, that, I think that's the bigger point, though. I'm not saying that I'm not. What I'm not saying is that we're not involved in in a relational co- like capacity with God, where God works through us, and we yield we yield to Him. We do. We I mean, for God to work through me, I have to yield to His Spirit. Yep. Um, but I, I think what's going on here is it's not the negation of work or pursuit of God or yielding to the Spirit or yielding to Christ. What I'm saying is, I think what the point here is, is these people probably were somewhat belligerent. They were probably somewhat already kind of hard in their heart. Um, and so it's, it's, it's not that it's like they were, they were completely shut off because they're like, it's like when, if you guys come back in the, or, or Willie goes back to Bernice, not that he grew up really, he grew up in Bernice, but say he did. And they're like, dude, you ain't nobody special. I knew, I knew you when you were, and they, they can't, they don't even have the capacity to hear that. Right. And mm-hmm. I think that's what was going on here. They're, they're looking at Jesus who is the son of God, but they're like, no, you're not. You're the guy that was out there playing wiffle ball with us. We were kids. You know, no, whatever, man, I'm not taking you serious. So I think it was that John MacArthur in his notes said it's, it it could have been an act of mercy on God's part, not to push them further into their hardening of their hearts. I mean, it could have been just like, you know what? I'm going to pull back here because your hearts are, your hearts, I'm just going to pull back. It could have been an act of mercy on, on Jesus's part to not perform miracles in their midst because it may have hardened them even more. I don't well, know if that's true, true or not. That's just a, com- yeah. a commentary I read about it. I was just using mm-hmm. it saying that I think he planted some seeds with his family members here by this that would later produce yeah. faith. I think you are correct. All right, so we're 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 way out of time. Let's uh let's continue this discussion in the overtime. If you want to join us, it's blazetv.com slash unashamed to hear us uh, talk a little bit more about this hometown dishonor. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else. Subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.